Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. As you can see here, we are continuing in our series on ethical stewardship, and I am once again joined by Pastor Connor. Connor, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada. Yes, that's right. We are recording. As you can see, I'm in red. Totally coincidental. I haven't gone to any celebration and don't intend on going to any tonight, but uh, it is Canada Day, and we are both Canadians. So, yes, you're right. Happy Canada Day. But uh, yeah. How are you feeling, Connor? Are you excited to keep this conversation going? Yeah, it's an important conversation that needs to happen. Um, and until, you know, all the problems in the world are solved, um, which will be in the resurrection, uh, we are constantly called to dwell on these things, focus on these things and work them out. So, yeah, wonderful. And I will echo everything Connor said right there. And I'll just remind people today, as advertised, we are continuing this series again on ethical stewardship. We're talking about topics like the environment, animals, personal health. We'll be digging into what the Bible says, what we can learn from history in general, but of course, church history specifically. And today, we're going to be getting into that first thing I mentioned, the environment. So just a recap for the premise of the series beyond that is we are working through some issues and some questions and some topics that I think people intuitively know are important, but often either neglect, ignore, or aren't sure how to approach because if you're in an evangelical church or a conservative Protestant church or a Christian church at large anyway, these issues are often associated with perhaps certain factions, certain progressive wings or voices that maybe you don't want to associate or are cautious getting into, but we're, we're facing it head on. As Connor said, these are important topics, topics that matter. And whether we agree, disagree, need to think further, the least that we could do is take them seriously and try to approach them with a right framework, or at least a framework where we could ask the right questions. So Connor, today's the environment. Let me just get us going here and ask you to maybe speak to this. Why should we care about the environment and environmental questions as Christians? Yeah, so I think we should we should begin looking at that either from kind of one would say uh, a bottom up approach, mm. which would be in a sense materialistic. Why should you care about the environment? Well, if you don't care about the environment and you trash it, everything in the environment dies. And that includes animals, plants, you and all your neighbors. Mm. If you kill the environment, you kill yourself. And if you're dead, there's nothing left to be concerned about. So there's no other option. If you plan on existing here in this planet, if you plan on your children existing here, you have to be concerned about the environment. And um, otherwise, you're going to be extremely short-sighted and illogical. There is no you or your descendants without an environment. And actually, to bring that uh, bottom-up approach back, when you look at scripture, you could start there as well if you want to, but I think this is the, the more reasonable way, way to do that, is God told us this implicitly in the scriptures. Before he creates you, he creates the earth. He creates the Garden of Eden. Then he puts Adam in it. And what does he say to Adam? Destroy the garden, trash it, litter there, burn everything, cut down all the trees. No, he doesn't say any of that. Rather, he says, tend this garden, protect this garden, be careful about this garden, be mindful of it, tend it, produce fruit in it, eat that fruit, live in this garden, um, and so on. Mm. So whether you look at this from a materialistic uh, bottom-up approach or a top-down approach, you could say God commanded it, you need it, your kids need it, your neighbors need it, obedience to God's law demands it, and um, th there is no way out of caring for the environment. So. Yeah. Mm. Connor, that's helpful. And I think that's something Christians should appreciate where when we speak about the environment, we're truly speaking about God's creation. And if we're going to honor God as creator and appreciate who he is as our creator, but also the creator of the place where we mm. stay, we at, least, we at least need to be aware of these issues and everything surrounding it because it's clearly important to God. He wouldn't have made it if it wasn't something he was concerned for or something he wanted to see flourishing or at least around. So I think we'll be getting deep into this. And as you could, mentioned, could I, could I just add a couple of things there before yeah, you continue on? Yeah, is um, it's it's not only that he created us there, but that's where we're going as well. Right. Mm. We don't as as I don't know how I could say this without offending certain groups in the church. As Christians who take theology seriously, we are aware that we're not going from 
earthly material life to spiritual uh, abstract heaven in the sky, right? right? That's the intermediate state. We are, all things are coming back down here into the new Jerusalem. Right. We start on the earth and we end on the earth because that's God's design. That's the only way God had ever intended it. And mm. I really like your point about um, God being creator. And if you wouldn't mind my um, propaganda for one second, maybe two seconds, we see in Luther's small catechism, um, where in the creed section, he begins this way. I believe in God, the father almighty creator of heaven and earth. What does this mean? And then he goes on, you know, I believe that God has created me. He sustains me. He's given all that I have, my eyes, my reason, my senses, my soul, my shoes, my house, home, food, drink, everything I have, everything I need for this body and life, the environment and everything, everything that is created, everything that is living, that has life, that is necessary for my life. He's given that to me. And all of this that he's done, he's done out of pure fatherly divine goodness. That is what being a creator is. And he's created all of these things for you and for his own pleasure. And so when we get into it and make a mess of it, destroy it, we are being antithetical to what he created us to be. Mm, that, that's powerful, Connor. And please feel free whenever you want to insert some Luther. That is most welcome here. Uh, as you can imagine, Baptists, my audience is largely evangelical Baptists. If there's one Lutheran that I think we have to take seriously, it would be Luther. It's unfortunate. That might be the only Lutheran name we know in addition to you, but uh, feel free, the the small catechism, large catechism, whatever, whatever you're bringing, uh, let us know. But uh, Connor, I think that what you started with is a helpful point. As much as we want to approach this environmental question or topic with a mind for the beginning, we also need to have a mind for the end where we're starting with Genesis 1 and creation. But as Christians, we're longing for that Revelation 21, where it started with heaven and earth being created. And we're looking forward to new heaven and new earth and that heavenly Jerusalem. And it's present here on earth. So there's so much. I, I think as we talk and as we reflect, we're going to see to use the big theology terms, how creation and eschatology, how beginning and end just tie together and we have this environment drawing us all together and as we talk more and get into it more we're going to see not only is it a question of beginning and end but the entire story throughout scripture but also throughout history we see how you, you don't have a history without the environment you don't have things happening without places where things are happening so it's it's this beautifully intricate topic i i think we're going to go a bit longer this episode to get into some of it but i think we're all going to walk away saying there's so much more here but that might be where we end this edition the questions that we should be asking the lines of thought that we could be taking and continuing ourselves but i i think now we have a lot that we want to say we really want to get into it so connor i think during your initial response you mentioned how we could have uh, a bottom up a bottom up approach or a top down approach there are different ways of approaching the environment as christians thinking about environmental questions but ultimately if we're just starting afresh right now we want to talk about the environment or at least be thinking about the environment as christians what is quote unquote officially or unofficially i don't know where should we start should we start with creation should we start by just what we see in front of us how we relate where where do you think we should begin this conversation yeah, I, I mean, I myself think it's most reasonable because of our experience and uh, being, a, you know, an ex experientialist uh, preacher or even an existentialist. I think our own experience is always the best place to start. But, you know, you may disagree with that. And if you disagree with that, there really is no right or wrong answer. And they all come to the same place. You can start with scripture. You can start with philosophy. You can start with what's right in front of your eyes. You can look at where we're going. You can look at where we came from. No matter where you start or where you end or where you are in that conversation, the answer is always going to be the exact same, which is that the environment is absolutely necessary for you. And it's tied directly to you, your personhood, your salvation, your existence, your purpose, and your relationship with God. Mm. That, that's powerful, Connor. And I think that's something, perhaps especially for these conversations, we need to just think of for a moment where 
there are different places where we could start with this conversation. And depending where you are, when you are, and who you are, that starting point might look different. If you're a person attending a church getting into these conversations, it might start in a Bible study when you're suddenly realizing, wow, the Bible talks about the environment quite a bit the more you look at it. Or it might just start with, you heard of, I think uh, the American Supreme Court recently had a ruling uh, about uh, a, a climate organization not having rights mm -hmm. to set legislation, something along those lines. I was just starting to read about it. But you might start with a, a legal political question, see how that shapes the policy of my country and that shapes what I can do or what I could see or what I will do in my life. Or you could start with the fact that, hey, I have for me, and of course I'm saying this, I have a little garden in my backyard. I wonder how that fits into me as a person. And we read about garden in Genesis, we think about that. So there's different places where we could start. And I think also there might be positive and negative places where we could start. And that's a topic I think you introduced last time where we might conceive of where do I begin with the environment as a Christian? Well, I might be, I won't litter, but then it might also be, I'll take steps to maybe be a conscientious consumer. I won't participate in this or that. So there are all different places to start. I think what we're saying is the place where you start doesn't necessarily matter too much. It might lead to slightly different places, but it should lead to the ultimate place, which is a care for creation, or at least an awareness of the conversation. So Connor, maybe I'll bounce it back to you a little bit. Uh, you start at a particular place. Uh, how do you track your trajectory of thinking when it comes to the environment? So maybe you could just mm. sketch us out maybe a little bit where's your starting point and how does that sort of develop as you encounter new issues or deepen your thinking? Yeah. So to spare the listeners, a bunch of uh, academic theological jargon known as the, you know, the hermeneutic circle. Um, let's just say this is again, no matter where you start, whether it's experience, which is where I start just because of how my brain works, or if you start with scripture or philosophy or anything, your trajectory and the way that you would track your progress is simply to get all of those included because that's the way that as really and this might put some people off depending on how their theological tradition views things like philosophy or experience or whatever um that might put them off but really we want to be including all of those things um including our own experience other people's experience what we see in the world around us with what scripture speaks to us, with what is reasonable, philosophically speaking, with um, creation and redemption and salvation and tying all of that together to create what some would call, you know, a worldview. Uh, and not just a worldview, but really a way of life, um, as one might say, even a cultus or culture. And I really like uh, just to tie in the thing about gardening or the thing about practice or the thing about the way that these things form and inform our lives. As you go along that journey, looking, for example, in your own experience, you might see litter is absolutely disgusting. Um, and it's, it's, it's an eyesore. You, everyone knows it's not nice. Everyone knows it's wrong. Everyone feels guilty when they do it. Um, simply listening to that own experience, the way that your own mind and conscience and heart responds to litter, pick it up and throw it away, right? You might then get to the text and see other things about um, God's view of the sacredness of even animal life and plant life, and you might start acting accordingly, right? Mm -hmm. Not cutting down trees unnecessarily, not taking animal lives unnecessarily. You might then go philosophically even economically and say, well, how does this, how should I as a voter, as a citizen of whatever nation I live in, respond to this at the polls in the way that certain policies are forming and informing my own society? How can I participate in a culture of creation as a, a son or daughter of the creator? Because of mm. course, Jesus says, you, know, you are as sons, as what your father are, you will either be, you know, the children of the liar, who is your father, or the children of life, uh, who is your father, and so on, right? Are you children of Abraham? You have faith. Are you children of God? Then you create and sustain and protect life. Mm. And so um, the way that we form and inform our lives creates that culture and it does so scripturally it does so philosophically it does so experientially and all of that forms together 
to create the whole person, a kind of like a, a soul and body together, make a nefesh, right? Um, so you're, you're trying to look for the holistic, like really the whole, and uh, that's something that culminates, let's say, in a society of people who have gardens in their backyards, who don't litter, who pick up litter, who reverse the damage that's done to the environment. And that's really what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming for a lifestyle that lives in the trajectory that God is already taking us from creation through the death of things toward the creation of life, the protection of life and the undoing of death itself. Mm. Connor, that that's helpful. And as you were speaking, and as I was processing everything you're saying, I think I'm realizing perhaps three things. First of all, whether we acknowledge it or not, we are people in an environment and we are playing a role in it no matter what we say. So whether we're conscious of it or unconscious of it, what we do and what we believe actually impacts our environment. The second thing that I'm picking up on is that's a good thing that we should recognize and just we should pay attention to that, whether whether you're unconscious or uh, unconscious or conscious, you're affecting it, but you should be conscious about that where you are here and we speak about scripture. So our starting point in terms of knowing what God feels scripture makes it clear that creation is God's creation and that he cares. And philosophically and experientially, I think we can confirm that or people with perhaps with different theological perspectives might reshape that order. But that's where we can really see that we should as Christians care about the environment. But then that third thing that comes to mind is thinking, this really is such a large topic where it gets to not only my personal actions, but as you're alluding to, how I act or how I believe that the government should respond to the environment or how I believe not only myself, but my community should act according to an awareness of creation and the environment. So there's so much there. And I think that's where a, a constant theme of this series will be. There's a lot of different ways people could slice it up. So already I'm thinking some of those practical questions is people might think of this and go, well, if we're saying the environment matters and litter is bad, should I then be zero waste when it comes to plastics and different goods like that? And that's a conversation. Or, hey, the environment matters, this and that. Do I have to vote for a Green Party or something similar? Hey, the environment matters. Should I be spending three hours every day picking up litter? So those are the kind of case studies or questions that might jump to people's minds. And what we're doing is laying a foundation where hopefully people can be equipped and then think about those questions and maybe come out with an answer where I don't think everyone, I don't think it's likely everyone's going to come out of here a super on fire, green peace kind of thing like that. But I think that's where we could see Christians are perhaps best suited to have some of the best approaches while also the most balanced approaches. But that's a long shot. I'm just saying right now we have a lot to talk about. Right. And, and if I could just yeah. add, add there as well is that uh, the culture of life and of ethical intent, it, it really is like an intentional stewardship. If we want to talk about an ethical one, um, it is the kind of society and people that ask questions about what they should do right. in a whole nutshell. That mm. is what we're talking about. We should be asking the question, what should I do in regard to the environment? What should I do in regard to my neighbor? What should I do in regard to myself? This mm. is the whole of the topic that we've been discussing that this whole series is about right no that that's exactly right connor so with that said and recognizing that there are so many there are dozens upon dozens of specific case case by case kind of what should i do here we should be thinking about but perhaps we could start by laying out some foundational principles so i'll ask you this connor get your thoughts what do you think are priorities of our priorities as Christians should be when we encounter these questions of the uh, God's creation and the environment. What, what are those guiding principles we must be employing, working with, or at least keeping in the back of our mind as we encounter these questions? Yeah, so here I think the answer for me is one that is very Lutheran, unsurprisingly. Yeah. Um, and, and what I mean by this is many other theological traditions like to root our um, main point of focus, our main concern upon, you know, obedience to God. And we all, I, I believe we're all going to get to that same place, but the way that it's focused, the direction it's going is going to be different from a Lutheran perspective mm -hmm. where obedience to God is not the thing that's really named, but the actual concern of the topic we're discussing, mm -hmm. right? So what should be our main point of concern in regard to the environment? Well, the Lutherans should say, 
the environment, right? And mm -hmm. then when we speak of our neighbor, what should our main concern be in regard to our neighbor? Our neighbor, right? And so it's nothing is left as a means to the end of something else, right? So your neighbor is not the means of the end to your glorifying or doing something for God, but they are the end in and of themselves. That's how God loves them. That's how God loves you. And that's how you should love them. And just so with the environment, of course, it's all inter intermingled though, when you get down to it, um, as was said earlier, if the environment is destroyed, you're destroyed. Your kids don't have anywhere to, they won't exist. Um, and so you, you could go that way, but, and this gets back to what I mentioned earlier in passing is the hermeneutic circle, but really we should focus the end and uh, point of concentration as the thing in and of itself as the means, or sorry, the end in and of itself. We care for the environment for the sake of the environment. That's why God does it. That's why he created it. He wanted to. Why? Don't know. He didn't tell us that. Um, but in, in doing that, he doesn't say, you know, I do this for this and this, I do this for this and this. But in every, in every aspect, um, his care is very focused. His, his care is very pointed. Um, and he loves and cherishes every single thing. We see so many texts of this uh, all over the Old Testament, especially the psalm, where every single deer that is born, the psalmist says, um, the Lord does so. The Lord births every single fawn out of its mother deer he's intricately deeply involved in every single thing that happens in every tree and every leaf and every animal in every brook or stream or lake or whatever it is all him there uh, all because he cares about his creation and so we again as sons and daughters of that god uh, should act in the same way so my first answer is when we come to the environment uh, we should do so caring about the environment itself and I think that's important because the Christian environmentalist scene, which is not dominated by Lutherans because nothing is dominated by Lutherans except the beer industry, mm -hmm. is right. um, it's, it's usually as a means to an end. People would say and do say we have to care about the environment because of obedience for the sake of obedience, or we have to care about the environment because we're commanded to care for people. And I find that frustrating pers personally because god commanded that we care about the environment itself right so at brass tacks we need to be caring about the environment itself and that needs to be our first and foremost concentration with the environment and when we get to the neighbor yeah to the neighbor when we get to the self yes the self right so every it's kind of like you have realms of stewardship or areas of stewardship and in those areas you need to be focused on that thing Mm. Connor, that that's helpful. And I'm realizing that as we're getting into the environment, this is also a bit of a, uh, a an instruction on what Lutherans are about and how they approach different issues, where I think a lot of my listeners, or perhaps the ones who have read John Piper, would be mm. quick to say, why do I care about the environment? Well, I glorify God through yep. the care of my environment, uh, through the care of not only my environment, but the environment in general. And it would be an emphasis upon Perhaps, and maybe this is me just speaking in my own experience or how I would approach issues where I want to do my best job because I know that this is a reflection of who my God is in me, where I am serving God to the best of my ability in that. So there might be a place of wondering, and this is where I think the audience would be well equipped to think through these issues. While we all want to approach the environment well, and Connor brought up the, the Christian environmental circles where, unfortunately, I'm not too familiar with them uh, because I'm not involved in them, but just being aware that there are different ways of conceiving of our approach to the environment. But I think at the end of the day, we're all seeking to, hopefully, I think where we're unified is saying, hey, we want to care for the environment. How exactly we phrase that might have some implications on how we do that or how strongly we do that. But hopefully we're able to think cogently and be open to conversations like this one where we're saying, hey, do we care for the environment for the sake of the environment? Do we care for the environment for the sake of our perhaps Christian witness or the glory of God in a in a Piperite kind of sense like that right. or a reform sense? So there, there's very that's very interesting. And I hope people hear that. And I'm sure that's something we're going to keep coming back to where our and this might also be a good conversation for people to hear. If you're a Lutheran listening, a Baptist listening, a Reformed person listening, an Anglican person listening, your denominational label speaks of a tradition that has implications on your day-to-day -day life 
and it's worth getting to know it. So Connor and I, we were talking before, I hope Connor doesn't mind, but uh, me mentioning this, I think it's important if you're a Lutheran invested in a Lutheran church, you know what that tradition is and you seek to act accordingly to the best of your ability. And if that makes you uncomfortable, perhaps a Lutheran church isn't a place for you. And I think Connor and I would agree if you're a Baptist in a Baptist church and you're not willing to think like a Baptist and see that there's a tradition there, then like, what, what does it actually mean? And I think we could see how this already, the environment, something that seems to a lot of people totally disconnected from Protestant theological traditions, there's actually a lot to it there. And a lot of history has been written. And I'm grateful, Connor, we're, we're going to have to come back to this. When we get to the church history aspect there, I, I'm sure we're going to discover that there is a wealth of information, whether it's in catechisms and sermons and hymns, even, uh, I think that will be interesting to see that there's so much written and so much to share. But Connor, I want to get you talking a bit more here. We spoke about priorities. You shared that from your Lutheran perspective, caring for the environment for the environment's sake. That's modeling after your view of understanding God cares for the environment for the environment's sake. I, I just want to ask then, what perhaps does that actually mean or look like to say, I care for the environment for the environment's sake? What Maybe what are some examples of what you might say in response to environmental questions with that frame of mind approaching it? Yeah, um, <laughs> I guess I would like to do it via illustration and in a little bit of a roundabout way. Have you ever known somebody or known of somebody, encountered somebody who worked a minimum wage job for a boss that may have, you know, maybe it's a small business, maybe, you know, someone who works minimum wage for a guy who owns his own pizzeria. And that was his dream to create his own pizzeria, establish that. And, um, you know, he has to hire some staff, but the staff don't share that dream. The staff don't care about that. You know why they're serving you? They don't, they don't, they don't care at all about you. They don't care at all about pizza. The owner does. And so if the owner's there, he's going to make you an amazing pizza. You know why? Because he cares about pizza. He loves pizza. You know what the minimum wage guy is going to give you? He's going to give you what he can give you while still keeping his job. Because at the end of the day, he is there for his paycheck. He's not there for the love of pizza. And he's not there for you. Right? And so this is, really does come out. Um, in Lutheran writings that what God really desires, what um, good works really look like is a freedom, right, to do things for the sake of things, right, to love freely for the sake of the, to be the guy who loves pizza, to make the pizza because he wants to, because he loves pizza, because he loves you, maybe, I don't know, mm. right, maybe your grandmother makes you the best pizza, but if she hated you, would she make the best pizza? No, right? If she was just working a minimum wage job, would she put all that time, sweat, blood, and tears into that pizza? No, she wouldn't, right? And so the, the intention and the reason that we have to do things, whether they're the end itself, the focus, or the means to the end, uh, really do, a Lutheran would say, impact the way and the effort and the intention and the love that goes into our care and our work for that thing. Um, and that really is what pictures... Um, God's love for us mm. is just like God. He, as, as a Lutheran would say, he, he loves us because of us. Not, 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 I'm not saying because we have merits, right? He loves us for our sake, um, not because of our merits, but for our sake and not for himself. And just so when we love others, we shouldn't love them for us. We shouldn't love them even for God. But as Luther says, you know, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. Your neighbor does. And what this really comes down to is the question, do, do we actually care about anything at all? Or do we only actually care about one thing and then tangentially do other things that that one thing dictates we do, right? That um, is, well, it's a different worldview, uh, but it also <laughs> impacts the, the questions that we ask, the concerns that we have, the way that we go about things and the intensity at which we pursue them. Mm. Okay, that that's helpful to think about. And I think that pizza illustration that that really that really uncovers something because now I'm imagining there, there might be cases where so you get the pizza worker, perhaps who shares that vision of I love pizza, I make the best pizza, but I can also in my mind thinking about perhaps different theological frameworks, you might get a person saying, well, I might not care too much about pizza, but I love the owner so much, 
I'm going to make the best pie possible. Or you get the person who might say, hey, like, I love pizza the most. And of course, I love the owner. But at the end of the day, I want to make sure I can honestly earn this paycheck. So I'm going to make the best pizza possible. And you can see how you might have different people making the best pizza possible, but for different reasons. And perhaps we could say, and this is where perhaps disagreement might be, is one way of viewing things. Does that ensure a better pizza or does that ensure you're getting the right framework in the pizza? Does the pizza owner love one person more than the other or prefer one approach more than the other? And there's a lot there. That's a powerful, powerful teaching tool, Connor. I'll have to use that in different things. And perhaps that's a way of explaining uh, different Protestant traditions or Christian identifying traditions or world religions at large, perhaps yeah. you can really extend that out where maybe some people are saying, Hey, I want to make the best pizza so that one day I get to be my own pizza shop owner. I don't know if that alludes to Mormonism or, <laughs> or something else, but uh, for, perhaps there's something there, but that that's, that's really helpful in thinking about perhaps how we could approach the, the general question. So now Connor, let me broaden the scope a little bit here uh, and just think about perhaps two or three big picture kind of questions. And then I think when we wrap it up, I want to make sure we talk about how this all relates to the gospel. But the first thing, as a Christian approaching the environment, I think many people might be intimidated by the size of the conversation. So they understand for me, myself, personally, I could choose to litter or not. I could choose to recycle or not, this or that. But the environment, when it comes down to like the carbon gas emissions and all that kind of stuff, that seems like it's all about government and that's all about people in power. Why do you think should Christians care about those big issues or is that beyond them? Is that something Christians should be aware of or should we just say, Hey, that's, that's too big for little old me. So I'll just pass it off to the, hopefully the politicians, a Christian who does the right thing. How do you think we should conceive about that in a big scale? Yeah. So um, just in regard to let's, well, let's begin this way is, Firstly, we need to recognize that environment is a specific place. Mm -hmm. Specifically, it's the place that you live. And so, again, this is why I think it's so helpful to start experientially is what's in front of you, right? And what are you doing? And do you understand the impact of things you do? Because you can't impact what somebody else else does now you you might say oh yes i can through voting but you can't choose how someone else votes right Right. you can choose to influence them to vote a different way but that's only something you are doing at the end of the day you cannot impact what they do or how they vote you can impact how how you vote you can even influence other people to vote a certain way but no matter what No matter what scope we're talking about, it's only you that you control. And so you need to begin there, of course, holistically. And I don't mean this in a a baby steps, start small way, but really a holistic way. Um, You know, flying is bad. What are you going to do about that? I'm going to ask that um, uh, culture of care question. Should I fly? Right. Should I? Is there an alternative that's better? Um, you know, what are the pros and cons of such a thing? You may come to one conclusion or another, but it's the asking the question that's important. Should I litter? Should I pick up litter? Right? Should, and and this has to do with the actions of other people. Should I pick up litter that I didn't put there? Right? Mm. This is another question. And then, of course, yeah, when we get to government issues, for example, and I know that this is, uh, for some individuals, maybe this is like a uh, hot button issue. I don't think it should be as a conservative Protestant. Thinking of abortion, if you care about abortion and think it's infanticide, right, should you stop other people from doing it? Should you vote against it? I see no other option personally. And I know that, the, you know, there's a neutrality is all the rage these days, but I don't think it exists in reality. Whether we're talking about the environment, whether we're talking about the life of uh, preborn infants or whatever it is, Whenever it is and wherever it is, if you care about something, if you think something needs to be protected and somebody is attacking it, the Lord in his own word commands you to stop that damage from being done, to rectify it and to protect it. And so that carries on forward into the question of environmentalism, into the question of your neighbor's health, right, which is directly related to the matters of abortion and in relation to your own bodily self. Thanks, Connor. That gives us, I think, a lot to think about. And definitely when you bring up abortion that that's definitely one where i think 
my audience here one way or another, per, most likely one way would feel quite strongly about. And maybe that that might be a place where I'll, I'll follow up with two questions. So perhaps first of all, on the whole issue of voting, I think a lot of Christians, whether we like it or not, they often look to their church leaders or mature Christians to sort of get an indication of whom to vote for. And recently, I think the reality is just shooting straight. We're having an honest dialogue here. Again, people, you're getting honest thoughts. I think a lot of Christians in my circles would feel like, hey, we have to vote for the conservative party because they're the conservatives. And that's something where I think a lot of Christians now, especially with uh, in Ontario elections, there were some uh, breakaway conservative parties where suddenly conservatives felt like, hey, we have some options here. But then, of course, there are other Christians, whether, uh, again, shooting straight, there's uh, in my part of Ontario, the reality is even the most conservative people of certain ethnic groups, they will vote for other political parties because that's their guy running, whether it's for the Liberals or the NDP. And there's all sorts of political conversations. I don't mean to get too political, but perhaps the question is this, just to make it clear. Let's say, Connor, we recognize that there are issues alongside the environment that really, really matter. So social issues or economic policies or different things like that. And there's a party that we traditionally vote for because they're the ones who are closest to offering a pro-life uh, vision of a, on abortion, or they're the ones who will do the best in preserving uh, certain status policies as it re relates to the church, whatever it might be. But let's say this party that is otherwise what we want to vote for just has a terrible approach to the environment, whatever that might mean. How would you think that we should navigate that? Is that, is the environment, is that, should that be on the level of a single issue thing? Should we abstain from voting if we can't find a party that checks all the boxes? Do you think that might be a place where we just have to suck it up and vote a certain way? Do you have any general principle for how you approach that or general principle that you could sort of suggest how people might think of this issue? I do, yeah. Um, personally, I find it silly, and I know some people listening to this will get very mad at this. I find it silly that lots of Christians, especially pastors, want to be a political, non-political in the pulpit or anywhere else, even as a, as a Christian, generally speaking. When you open up the Word of God, um, there are numerous commands, instructions, direct uh, words to governments, either directly from God or by his prophets or from his church. Um, Christianity is inherently political. And part of that, not, not we could, we could split, some like to split this theologically and ethically. I don't think that's possible. If you do, that's fine. Um, at the very least, ethically, we, we are bound to witness for the sake of our neighbor, ourselves, and the environment, right? There's the three main realms of ethics. Mm -hmm. And so as we do that, as we um, look around at the world, uh, especially in democratic societies, however, if you're not, you still are to uh, witness to the government. Uh, we see this in the Old Testament, of course, especially with prophets who speak to the government, say, you know, this thing and this thing and this thing that you're doing is wrong. They didn't have voting polls, but what they had was mouths and their kings had ears. And so they spoke the words of God to those people who are ministers of God and what Lutherans and the Reformed would call the left-hand kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. You can disagree or agree with that. It doesn't really matter. The fact mm -hmm. of the matter is this, is that politics are inherently ethical. Christianity is inherently ethical. And so the two only mix insofar as the law of God is being insisted upon. That doesn't mean enforced by the sword, right? That doesn't mean the revolutions need to happen. Um, what it does mean is that they are being insisted upon by the power of the word, which is all that you have been given as a Christian. Mm -hmm. If you are a state officer, that might be different. You have the sword then. But for most of us, what we have is we have words. And so we should speak those words. Now, in matters of you know practical application, yeah, I think also there's a really big problem that we as Christians, as the Christian church here on earth have, especially in the West, um, is being either doomerist, pessimistic people who vote for, you know, the lesser of two evils. I do not condone that. Or they are very much single issue piecemeal voters who fail to live holistically in the word and law of God. 
Mm. And um, that might shock some people that I would say that, you, you know, even, of course, I'm going to rejoice uh, at, at anybody who is, you know, against abortion. But at the same time, we have fallen into this kind of thing that we were discussing in the last episode where you may have one party or not even a party, but just the general right is really good on things like uh, sexual ethics, um, life issues, but they're horrible on issues of um, poor people, refugees, uh, mercy, <laughs> war, um, economics, and everything else, right? And the environment. Uh, and the left is good on those things, but that on sexual ethics and life issues. Whereas the word of God brings these two things together and it doesn't leave room for taking half or half. And so what I would say is really, we, we need to be speaking those words to whatever parties are there um, to declare what 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 is right and good. You can say God commanded that, or you could simply say it's right and good and obviously so. Either mm. either gets the point across, either gets to the same destination. And I really think, um, as one who is already a, a card-carrying member of the Christian Heritage Party, if you don't find a, a party that's out there, not voting is not the only option. You can start one, right? You can do that. That's legal. This is Canada. Um, if it if it wasn't, yeah, sure, keep speaking. But um, this this is always the thing is that we always tend to have, especially in the West, this super pessimistic um, doom doom and gloom kind of mindset where if, if something's not already being done, oh, it's a lost cause. It's never going to be done. The world doesn't work that way. Uh, believe it or not, we didn't always have cell phones. We didn't always have Zoom. These things were created. These things were done. Believe it or not. Um, slavery once existed, but mm. somebody didn't like that, right? And so they put an end to that. Uh, believe it or not, Roe Ro versus Wade was law until last week, and now it's not. Um, and so a change can come into this world. And so we need to be hopeful. We need to be daring and bold. And we need to actually uh, get the gears moving here on some of these ethical things that are life and death issues, that are obedience and disobedience issues. Um, and, and really try to be the light of Christ in every way possible, holistically speaking, rather than just letting things slide, um, because we are the, 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 the people representing the living and um, um, incarnate God who works in and with his people here on the earth and is very deeply concerned. If we were the people of a deist God, that might make sense, but we're not, right? We're not mm. clock, uh, clock makers here, right? Right. Yeah, Connor, that is that was so incredibly coherent and helpful. And what I want to do is before offering my own thoughts on this specific question, I just want to make a few comments that speak to this series in a more meta way, perhaps, where uh, three things. First of all, the people here, what they're seeing is an honest dialogue where feel free to agree, feel free to disagree, feel free to ask more questions, but join in with the dialogue. Connor just said a lot that you might be listening going, oh, I don't agree with that there's a comment box on YouTube. Let us know so that we can continue on the yeah. conversation. The, the second thing here, Connor, and this is where I strongly agree with what you're saying, is that I think Christians, especially conservative Christians, part of this series is, personally, I think you agree as well. I want the environment, personal health, animal rights, those conversations, I don't want them to be taboo anymore. I want us to have those conversations without fear of hey, I said the environment, now I'm a progressive, or hey, I said <laughs> animal rights, now suddenly I'm a, I'm a PETA hippie, whatever people might say. No, let's actually talk about it. And I would agree, I think politics is one of those things. Often people say there are two things you don't discuss in polite company, that's religion and politics. Christians know like, hey, like we have to talk about religion. But I think you're right, looking at scripture, looking at the role of the church of Christians, no, we need to be talking about politics. And if you're a Christian listening and you want to be more informed on politics and you want to learn about what you should do, how you should do it, and you're not willing to talk to your brothers and sisters or even your pastors about this, I, I think you're you're wasting the resources that are right there for you that you could that you can trust and actually have a good and honest dialogue with. And the difficulty here is, and this is where I'll just plug. I'm so grateful for uh, my lead pastor at my church, Paul. He preached a. Uh, a sermon series and uh, what a few of the the sermons were how do we disagree well and how do we talk about things when we disagree I think we need to bring those many passages of scripture you think of I believe Romans 14 it gets into that um, I just uh, my girlfriend and I were talking she raised that passage today 
just as we were reading scripture, but that's something where Christians can disagree well, but we should have the conversations about politics. And as you were getting at, I think we need to think carefully about our role. And this is where I think you're right, the Lutherans and Reform, they have the benefit of that steeped magisterial tradition that goes back to the Reformation. But I want to encourage Baptists for a moment here. You might think Baptist and, oh, separation of church and state, I need that separate, I can't talk about one or the other, but Get, get to know our tradition a little bit and realize how that there is so much nuance there. There's so much history there. You look, especially in America, where for better or for worse, Baptists were in the political sphere. They were talking, but with a recognition of how much they should say in a certain role. Or in England, Baptists were, they were on the front lines where there's a reason why Baptists were going to jail. And that <laughs> a, large, a large part of it was a lot of them were Republicans in the time when people were monarchists. But later on, a lot of them were fervent monarchists when the monarchy was out of favor. But at least people should be aware that they should have conversations. And I think Connor is definitely right, where we might not want a Christian government per se, but I think we would all want Christians in government at the very least. And then we can build on that in different directions. But Connor, I now want to respond to something you were saying where, hey, like voting for a political party. And I think you're right where like we have so many options to consider. And maybe I'll just take it to after the election where Christians, you're listening to this now. I think we already to recap, we spoke about why you should care about the environment, all the different places you could start. And then we start talking about how does this relate to my personal actions and how I'm conducting these personal actions with the mind for God, the environment, my neighbor, different things. But I want to encourage you that if you're a Christian and you're living in Canada, you have an elected representative with a phone number, with an email. Even after they're elected, you are allowed to reach out to them and share your concerns. And believe it or not, you're allowed to reach out at them, be frustrated or share your concerns, even if they're not the person you voted for. I think a lot of people get into the mind, oh, like uh, I, I did, I, or I elected this person, I'm not allowed to complain, or I didn't elect this person, I'm not allowed to reach out to them and have an honest and nice conversation with them. That's baloney. If you have an elected representative on any level of government, please reach out to them. And that's where you could advocate for yourself. So I think Connor, great points, especially as it comes to thinking about these issues. And I think I would agree with you. Don't, don't settle for the lesser of two evils. And the one way you can express that is when you have that perhaps quote unquote lesser evil in office, whatever that looks like, you can, you can put the fire under them a little bit. You can make them aware how you're feeling. You can have those conversations, hopefully with your neighbors, with your church family and get those conversations going. Anyway, that's enough of me talking because as you can tell, I think both of us are quite passionate about these issues and, and how they apply. But Connor, I want to ask you a follow-up question on the politics, on the realities of just life in this world. I think a lot of people, especially as we're thinking about the environment and we're thinking about, you raised the idea of a plane, travel, what, what, what do I think about flying, different things like that. I, I want to just ask you, uh, a, a thing that people might be thinking about is, hey, I know that there are things that are bad for the environment, but the reality is that is baked into the way our world is. The reality is for a lot of people, hey, I know that it sucks to... Uh, burn fuel or something, but I got to drive to work every day. Or I know it sucks to use the plastic, which might end up in an ocean somewhere or this or that. But the reality is I have to buy my, my groceries and the ones that I get, it, it, it becomes so much of a hassle to get the brown paper bag ones or something like that. Do you think that, ha, maybe I'll just ask in general, what do, you, what do you think of those conversations? And this is a place people feel free to agree, disagree with Connor. I think we're both uh, thick skinned enough to just say what's on our mind. How do you approach those issues of some things we know are bad for the environment, but the reality is that's just life. Do you think that there are some places where we have to settle or do you think we need to just, we need to be revolutionary in how we approach these things? We need to make major sacrifices. What, what do you think on all that, Connor? I know that's a lot, but you, you got this. Yeah, it, it really goes back to what I was just saying, which is in the West, especially, not really surprisingly elsewhere in the world, but especially at really only in the West, we have um, been sucked into this pessimistic doom and gloom mindset, where if something is happening, it will always be happening. My efforts to change it, mm. useless, not even going to try. Um, that, that should not be our mentality as people of hope, as people who believe in um, 
reality where things change, right? And they change because human beings speak up and act differently and um, get engaged. Uh, so yeah, I would say we do need to be revolutionary, but I want to say three things as well. Firstly, yes. your ethics do not and will not, I promise you, um, coincide with your lifestyle and action. I believe by the law of God, I need to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, and being. I don't do that. Neither do you. Yes. And that shouldn't surprise you. I believe I need to be perfect as God is perfect. I don't do that, and neither do you. And so it is It is perfectly okay to say, I believe it's wrong to do this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get my hands messy. But that doesn't defeat, uh, that doesn't, sorry, um, erase the fact that I understand and agree with the idea that what I'm doing, I should not be doing, that it is wrong. And so you can be in that scenario and call upon the society around you, make known to the society around you, influence the society around you um, to restructure society, right? You could even look at, for example, Europe. Many places in Europe uh, were almost uh, and, and some actually were being structured in the same way that North America is structured. And that's very much a car centered society. Everything is very, um, I just say, I guess, stupidly laid out, <laughs> uh, destructively laid out. It's very ugly. It's horrible for the environment. It's horrible for your mental health and your enjoyment. And it's just bad. We all know it's bad. But in America and Canada, you know what we did about it? Nothing at all. But you know what they did about that same thing that was happening in Asia, that was happening in Europe, that was happening in South America? They changed it. They took the high, the four lane, eight way, eight lane, 8,000 lane highways. They ripped them out. They put in bike lanes. They got a better public transit system. They started taxing cars and gas. And then people said, oh, this is horrible. I need to change my life for about five minutes. They changed their life. They realized it was better for everyone. It was more enjoyable. It was the best. And they never went back. Um, mm. And so that's really, you know, it's not, it's not, um, mutually exclusive to be doing something and also call it calling for what you're doing to end because there are some things that are so systemic that we can't end them my, ourselves right? right but on the other hand um just think about it this way think of think think about the way people considered abortions um last week uh about how they understood slavery uh, however, hundred many years ago, that was and different nations have different timelines and so on. If we just sit here and let things happen, nothing at all will change. Um, but speaking up about them, doing things ourselves about them, refraining from things ourselves, and bearing testimony to the reasons why is what changes a culture. And changing a culture, changing other people's minds, other voters' minds, demographics' minds in a democratic society is how laws change, is how societies change, is how um, town and city structures change, and so on. Um, so, and, and that brings me to the third point that I want to make. So firstly, your ethics will not coincide with your actions. Secondly, you can and should, in fact, speak up about systemic issues and the need for change in infrastructure and so on. But thirdly, yes, um, you may find that there is a, a, a definitely a problem with gas, planes, whatever, and your job may require that. Now, I would ask you, um, why are you purposely living in a way that you know is really subpar when you could just as easily make the steps to begin uh, a process of job change or moving to somewhere that is less taxing on the environment, better for your neighbor, or so on and so forth? Um, you can do that. It doesn't have to be right now, right? You can take steps to change that, right? And so I hear from many, many people, they say things like, oh, electric cars, this and that, because you know, you, you can't drive very far with them. And it's like, okay, well, why do you live in the middle of nowhere? You're not a farmer, right? It doesn't make any sense. Um, you could just as easily move to the city. And usually the answer is, I don't want to, right? So we need to really be searching our hearts, asking ourselves, how are we, in, are we at all intentionally living? Um, and that's really where this starts. Intentional living, intentional speaking, intentional thinking. Mm. Connor, again, very helpful, a lot to think about there. And I think this very conversation, so we'll put a pin in it, because I think this will come up a big time when we talk about uh, animals and thinking about yeah. that. So I'm already thinking uh, about different dietary choices people make. And the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is like, uh, 
uh, options when it comes to milk. Like, you know, that you could have alternative <laughs> yeah. plant-based yeah. milks, but you still want your, your dairy and things like that, where you could see how there might be a way of thinking about that or conceiving of that, that people might find difficult. And I'm saying that as someone who just enjoyed some cow's milk uh, with some cereal earlier. So uh, I, I'm revealing that already, but that, mm. that Connor, I think is very helpful for people to think about. And you activated my trap card. I love talking about the urban planning and just I would love to have more walkable cities I would love to have bike infrastructure I was a bit of a bit of a local activist recently thinking about the electric scooters I don't know if those are in your town if all the oh, yeah. kids and people but oh I, I think there needs to be a bigger conversation about that because on one hand they're so good but on the other hand the kids are reckless on them so I don't uh, anyway, you activated my old man trap card. But anyway, I, I love that kind of stuff. And I think that's where we as Christians, we actually have more agency than we give ourselves credit for. We could start small, but then even large decisions about where you're going to live and the housing right now in Canada, different story, but where you're going to live, what kind of work you do, where you situate in accordance with your work, different things like that. We actually make a lot of decisions that could have a lot of impact not just on our day-to-day -day lives, but on our imp uh, on our footprint going forward for generations, if you think about it. So a lot, lot more there, Connor. You got the ball rolling. We'll pick it up on those later episodes. But now, final question. It would be uh, it would be a big misstep on me. We have a Lutheran pastor on and a Baptist elder talking. We cannot go away as two Protestants here, not speaking about how does the environment and the gospel, how do those intersect? How do, how can we speak of the environment perhaps with a gospel mind or how can we speak of the gospel with a mind for the reality that this all takes place in an environment so connor this is a free chance for you say whatever theological biblical gospel thoughts you have on this conversation for us please sure yeah i mean as a lutheran i suppose the thing everyone's expecting me to say is you're all forgiven for sinning which is true <laughs> um but as paul says you know that that doesn't then mean we should go and sin some more because grace will abound. And indeed, grace will abound if you do sin some more. But that doesn't mean we should go and sin some more just because it will abound. What we should do is look at what we see in the gospel itself, which is the sacrifice of God himself for people, little worms, who sinned against him all the way unto death for you. Not because he had to because he wanted to for your sake. And so I'm going to do the big fundamentalist no-no right now and say the chief thing, aside from your own forgiveness, that you should take from the gospel, when you encounter any question on any kind of ethic, especially ethical stewardship, intentional stewardship, or whatever it is, look at the cross and draw moral influence from it, right? What do you see there? You see the self-sacrifice of God for those who sinned against him not for his sake, but mm -hmm. for your sake, right? And then think again about how you are destroying the environment or killing your neighbor or whatever it is you're doing. I hope you're not doing anything like that. But if you were, right, and your reason was because I felt like it, then ask what your actions are being formed by and what they represent and look like. Do they look like Christ on the cross for sinners? If mm -hmm. not, why not? Should they be? Right. These are again, it's always the question when we're dealing with ethics. The question at root is always, what should I do or should I do this? Should I not do this? Hmm. Connor, that that is very helpful. And thank we we are so grateful. That was very Lutheran as expected and promised, which I will say is a good thing. While a Baptist listening might not agree with all the perspectives, I think we can find the value in that and appreciate the conversation. And maybe I'll take the the Baptist evangelical line. And on that conversation of the gospel, uh, I would encourage people to think bigger than they often think, where as we've gotten out through this entire time, uh, the classic division of scripture that evangelicals, and I think most, perhaps it's broader than, I only know it from evangelical circles, when we look at creation, the fall, redemption, and new creation, I would just encourage people, as you're sharing the gospel, consider how you might share the gospel in terms of the environment, where we can look around the world and see that something is wrong. And we don't need to just look at our own sin to recognize that this world is in desperate need of a savior. We see that every day in terms of natural disasters, in terms of how we destroy the environment and just the, the fall that we, we've all looked to and know we experience in terms of how we relate to the world. 
but I think we can encourage you while uh, Connor might say the, the, the Luther in line, you have all been forgiven, which, which I understand and appreciate. I would also say, look forward to the savior who will return. And this is a point where we'll all agree and we'll truly right every wrong and wipe away every tear and recognize how a big part of that is the new creation and let that be an encouragement to you. So Connor, I think I'm, we're, we're closing off on some excellent points and some things that hopefully people listening to this conversation, agree or disagree, will realize environment doesn't have to be a taboo. Please talk about it with your brothers and sisters at church. Please talk about it with your neighbors. And most importantly, and Connor, I think this comes, you so beautifully put it throughout, consider the environment. Just consider what you can do, whatever your starting point is, whether it's scripture, whether it's your experience, whether it's the philosophy, just realize this is something not only you're commanded to care about, but just simply you should care about. And I, I appreciate where you said, and that's something to think about. Should we care for the environment for the simple sake of the environment? I think that's something worth considering, worth wrestling with, agree or disagree. I think we could see the merit. And so Connor, perhaps I'll do this. I just gave my last words. Do you have any final encouragement for the audience as we close out this environment episode? Yeah, sure. Some some encouragement. All, all I would say is this, is... Um, we will fail in doing this and God does not expect or desire or command you to be the one who redeems all of creation and ends all of death and turns it into life. There is one who does that and it's he himself. Mm -hmm. And so you are only living in his light as a representation of him to other people. So don't think that you are going to be Christ to the world. You're not, um, but you are to bear his light and share it towards one another. Connor, helpful. That takes the pressure off in one sense, but also I think that was a healthy dose, dose of hope we got there. So we'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Connor. And everyone, thank you for listening. I hope that in a couple of weeks time, you will tune in. I think we'll be getting into the, the big conversation about animals. And of course, that means talking about not only animals that are living, but then animals that are dead and consumed for food. And that will be perhaps our spiciest conversation in this series, but maybe our most practical. I don't know. But anyway, everyone, until next time, take care.